Thank you, Son. The April 3rd, 2023 meeting of the Seattle Park District Board will come to order. It is 3.16 p.m. I'm Andrew Lewis, President of the Board. Will the clerk please call the roll? Board Member Mosqueda. Present. Board Member Nelson. Here in Chambers, present. Board Member Peterson. Here. Board Member Strauss. Present. Board President Lewis. Present. Five present. And just for the record, want to note that our colleagues, Council Member Herbold, or rather Board Member Herbold and Board Member Sawant, are representing the Council at the Regional Policy Committee and are excused, and that uh, Council Member Morales and Council Member Juarez um, are also excused uh, for um, uh, um, their, their, their pre-notice of being unavailable for the meeting. So I um, just wanted to put that on the record. Uh, approval of the agenda. If there is no objection, the agenda will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the agenda is adopted. Approval of the minutes. The minutes of the September 27th, 2022 and November 29th, 2022 Seattle Park District Board meetings have been reviewed. If there is no objection, the minutes will be signed. Hearing no objections, the minutes will be signed. Will the clerk please affix my signature to the minutes? Public comment. At this time, we will open the hybrid public comment period. While it remains our strong intent to have public comment regularly included on meeting agendas, the Park District Board reserves the right to end or eliminate these public comment periods if we deem the system is being abused or is unsuitable for allowing our meetings to be conducted efficiently. Uh, I don't see anyone in chambers who signed up. Do we have any remote public we commenters? We do have two uh, people remotely signed up, but they're not present. We could, um, I could monitor that and go back since maybe we got a, a quicker start than expected on starting the park district meeting. Um. Sure. Or if you'd like, I'll play the introductory video and that'll give us a few minutes to see if they're going to. Um... Sure, that sounds like a good compromise. Why don't we play the video and I will hold the public comment period open to give some time for the people who signed up remotely to call in if you're watching the meeting. Um, sounds so good, because go our, our advertised start time was three o'clock or following briefing. So it's we're not that much um, ahead yeah. of time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Seattle. We are the Emerald City, the city of flowers and the city of goodwill, built on indigenous land, the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. The Seattle City Council welcomes remote public comment and is eager to hear from residents of our city. If you would like to be a speaker and provide a verbal public comment, you may register two hours prior to the meeting via the Seattle City Council website. Here's some information about the public comment proceedings. Speakers are called upon in the order in which they registered on the council's website. Each speaker must call in from the phone number provided when they registered online and use the meeting ID and passcode that was emailed upon confirmation. If you did not receive an email confirmation, please check your spam or junk mail folders. A reminder, the speaker meeting ID is different from the general listen line meeting ID provided on the agenda. Once a speaker's name is called, the speaker's microphone will be unmuted and an automatic prompt will say, the host would like you to unmute your microphone. That is your cue that it's your turn to speak. At that time, you must press star six. You will then hear a prompt of, you are unmuted. Be sure your phone is unmuted on your end so that you will be heard. As a speaker, you should begin by stating your name and the item that you are addressing. A chime will sound when 10 seconds are left in your allotted time. As a gentle reminder to wrap up your public comments. At the end of the allotted time, your microphone will be muted and the next speaker registered will be called. Once speakers have completed providing public comment, Please disconnect from the public comment line and join us by following the meeting via Seattle Channel broadcast or through the listening line option listed on the agenda. The council reserves the right to eliminate public comment if the system is being abused 
or if the process impedes the council's ability to conduct its business on behalf of residents of the city. Any offensive language that is disruptive to these proceedings or that is not focused on an appropriate topic as specified in council rules may lead to the speaker being muted by the presiding officer. Our hope is to provide an opportunity for productive discussions that will assist our orderly consideration of issues before the council. The public comment period is now open and we will begin with the first speaker on the list. Please remember to press star six after you hear the prompt of, you have been unmuted. Thank you, Seattle. Okay, uh, board president, we have no council members in chamber, no citizens in chambers to speak and we have no citizens signed up remotely to speak for public comment. Okay, um, if the folks who signed up remotely um, had intended to, but us getting going 15 minutes later than initially planned had gotten in the way of that, do please email us your remarks. We do want to hear from you and apologize that we weren't able to hear from you this afternoon. So I will now close the public comment period and we will move on to our published agenda items. Will the clerk please read item one into the record? Agenda item one, resolution 56, correcting the meeting dates for a special for a Seattle Park District board meeting in 2023. Thank you. Uh, so we are joined by Tracy Ratzliff from our council central staff to go over this resolution. Um, so Tracy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, this is a, a very simple piece of uh, legislation that just corrects an error in, in the year of the meeting date that we're supposed to have in uh, October from uh, October of 2022 to October of 2023. Apologies for the typographical error in that uh, resolution that we passed in uh, November. Great. Uh, do colleagues have any comments on the resolution? Seeing no comments or questions, um, I move agenda item one, the resolution uh, for board action. Is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second that we vote on uh, confirming resolution 56. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 56? Board member Mosqueda. Board member Mosqueda. I'll come back to her. Board member Nelson. Aye. Board member Peterson. Yes. Board member Strauss. Yes. Board member Mosqueda. Yes. Thank you. And board president Lewis. Yes. Five in favor, none opposed. Uh, thank you. The vote has five affirmative votes and the resolution passes and will be adopted. Uh, let's go ahead to the next item on the agenda, item two, resolution 57. Will the clerk please read item two into the record? Agenda item two, resolution 57, amending the bylaws of the Seattle Park District to modify the rules regarding voting on park district resolutions. Thank you. We are also joined by Tracy Ratzliff on this item. Tracy, I'll turn it over to you. You're muted, Tracy. Thank you. Um, so this resolution essentially makes the bylaws of the MPD consistent with the council rules as it relates to the ability for council members or commissioners in this case, to abstain from legislation voted on by the MPD. To remind council members, um, per state law, the MPD actually takes action only via resolutions. And so the bylaws obviously talk about when you um, take votes on resolutions, what is permitted or not. In this case, we are silent about the ability to abstain, 
But because of some of the changes that took place uh, this past year about uh, related to, to city council action on ordinances and resolution, uh, I believe uh, the president desired to have the bylaws of the MPD mirror what those rules say uh, as it relates to the ability of uh, commissioners to abstain from uh, legislative votes. And in this case, this would all be about resolution. So the bylaws would, the change that's being proposed here would allow uh, for commissioners to abstain from resolutions only those that relate to a statement about the board's opinion. Any other pieces of legislation that actually approve the budget or approve bylaw change or policy changes would not allow for um, members to abstain uh, from those votes. Happy to answer questions if you have them. Tracy, thank you so much. Are there any questions for Tracy on the item in front of us? Okay, seeing none, um, I move passage of resolution 57. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Will um, the clerk please call the roll on the adoption of resolution 57? Board member Mosqueda. Aye. Board member Nelson. Aye. Board member Peterson. Abstain, just kidding, yes. <laughs> board member Strauss. Yes. And board president Lewis. Yes. Five in favor, none opposed. With five votes in favor, the motion carries, the resolution is adopted and the president will sign. Um, guide council member or board member Peterson with all of the dad jokes today. I need to take <laughs> notes. I need to take notes on that. I'm in the dad joke market now. Uh, we'll move on to item three. Will the clerk please read item three into the record? Agenda item three, report on the proposed performance measurements for the 2023 through 2028 Park District Spending Plan for briefing and discussion. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. We are joined now by a panel from Parks uh, in, a, um, in it looks like the boardroom at the Parks building. Uh, and why don't you guys go ahead and come off mute and introduce yourselves and we'll get into the presentation. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, Mr. President, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Park District uh, Council members. We are pleased to present to you today our Park District Cycle 2 ramp up and reporting plan consistent with the MPD plan that you all passed in October of last year. I'm pleased to be joined today uh, by my colleagues and individuals that are becoming very near and dear to me. Um, and they are the deputy superintendents for our park and recreation department. And so I'm joined by our chief of staff and the assistant superintendent who you all know well, Christopher Williams, joined by our deputy superintendent, Michelle Finnegan, deputy superintendent, Andy Schaefer, and our Interim Deputy Superintendent, Mike Schwindeler. Before we get started today on our presentation, do you, do you want me to start now, Mr. President? Could you say one more time there, AP? You're coming in a little, uh, a little bit garbled. I can mostly hear it clearly, but it, it, it kind of sounds like you're talking through a radio. Oh, apologies. How does it sound now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think it, I think that's fine. Um, but what what was your question just before uh, we had this? It, it, was it if you if you should just start the conversation or yes. the presentation rather? Correct. Yes, yes. I think that that is the uh, course of action we should take. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> before we get started uh, discover, discussing the deliverables, I just want to thank this. Uh, entire board for your hard work uh, for the past several years, but particularly in 2022 uh, to pass and implement uh, this legislation and the park district funding. I've had a real joy and pleasure being able to uh, brag on the opportunity that your action and the citizens of Seattle have made our city among the most funded park agencies per capita than any other city in North America. 
and we both understand the import and magnitude of this investment and look forward to discussing our plan with you as we begin the implementation for cycle two. I, alongside all of our park and recreation staff, <clears throat> are eager to get started on our plan and to roll up our sleeves and begin really implementing these expanded projects and the next phases of programs to better serve the residents of the city of Seattle. We want to continue to serve them every single day as we commit to uh, sharing our refreshed vision, mission, land acknowledgement, and equity statements that focus on healthy people, a thriving environment, and a vibrant community. Indicative of this city's commitment to be a leading city for inclusion, climate action, and economic development. Starting out today, uh, I wanted to announce with you all, and I've shared with you before, that we've now organized our department into three main branches. And among our newest branch is the development of our planning and capital development branch, which is being head, headed by our interim superintendent, uh, Mike Schwimmfeller, who will be presenting a little bit later or answering some questions. And I'm proud to be supported by them and proud to have a new focus on this important work going forward. And at this time, I'm going to pass over our presentation to our Deputy Superintendent, Michelle Finnegan. Um, but I do want to acknowledge and thank her and her amazing team who have been really working hard to coalesce all of the mandates and the reporting requirements in the ramp up plan um, that we were able to transmit to you all last Friday and excited to get into our presentation and then be available for any questions that any members might have. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thanks, AP and Councilmember Lewis and board members. Please interrupt if you need to because the way we're sharing screens, we have a little technical difficulty signing in, so we can't actually see you while we're presenting. Um, so please let us know if there's hands or anything. Um, we are, and thank you, AP, for that context. We are pleased to be here with you today to talk about a key deliverable that you requested as you adopted the cycle two funding plan specifically in resolution 51 you requested performance metrics for both new and continuing initiatives at the detailed line of business level and that's our new um, all fund not just mpd but all of our funds uh, reporting structure so in implementing and preparing this deliverable for you, we wanted to be mindful about articulating our commitment to the public about the services we're expected to deliver, set clear expectations about our approach to ramp up in service delivery in 2023 specifically, and then establish accountability for how we'll track progress throughout cycle two. In order to accomplish this, we actually sent over three deliverables on Friday. Our reporting plan answers the specific Resolution 51 request. Um, I do want to point out as you review it that while there is a ton of work, and I hope you'll see a lot of great work um, in that product, we're also adopting and continue to adopt a continuous learning approach to our metrics, and we hope to grow and improve those throughout cycle two. Um, as we did in cycle one. We also submitted a ramp up plan, which is really focused on transparency on how we're ramping up services and project delivery in 2023 and beyond. And then finally, we sent over a few appendices that outline our plans to address other policy direction and requests you've included in resolution 51, recognizing this was just one of those as well as to provide more context into our capital delivery approach for cycle two, um, as we know, and take great uh, focus on getting that work accomplished. And that is informed by an evaluation done during cycle one on that line of business with Burke and Associates. So that is also included. So we're going to dive into each of those sections um, first with the reporting plan as it's the item you specifically requested and I'm sure 
since Friday afternoon, you have all spent a lot of time going through this document. Um, kidding. Um, so I just want to get a little bit of an overview. Um, one of the primary lessons we learned in cycle one is that one funding source Reporting on one funding source does not tell the full story on SPR programs and services. And so, in almost all cases, the park district resources amplify our base budget. And so, truly understanding those require a comprehensive lens. And so, we appreciate you all as the park district board um, going with us in this endeavor to look at lines of business and what we're calling detailed lines of business. And we'll go through an example in a minute, but um, you know, using the activation line of business. But as you review the plan, you will see each detail line of business includes the total 2023 budget, the performance metrics that we're proposing, our planned approach, both recognizing which items would be included on our financial and performance dashboards and what additional metrics are tracked in order to include in blogs and annual reports and other communications we do throughout the year. We identify targets when it's applicable. We clarify which ones are cycle one metrics that we're continuing or new cycle one or cycle two metrics and some aren't actually applicable to the NPD but we still wanted to include them. And then we also wanted to provide an opportunity for people to know how to stay more involved and engaged in each line of business so we provided that Excuse me. So this is one example, again using activation, we included a summary of that, what that line of business means to us and more specifically in this example, the center city activation detail line of business, again, reflected the budget, the performance metrics that you'll see one of these on our dashboard and the others will be tracking throughout the year and how they relate to the cycle. Um, MPD cycles. And finally, at the bottom, you'll see that there's a place for people to stay engaged and learn more about the events happening downtown um, this year. So with that, some of our other um, highlights is it just examples is the park district funds are allowing us to provide approximately six 60,000 hours of public operating hours at our community centers each year. Thanks to the Parks District, that's a 8% increase over 2022 levels. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, not specific to the either cycle, but one of our key measures that we use in our grounds maintenance is our park inspection program. We've come to the council a few times to talk about that program, and that provides an overall metric in terms of how park maintenance resonates for people actually utilizing our parks looking at amenities such as comfort stations, play areas, sports courts, et cetera. And then hoping at least 80% of those assets are meeting our goals. Um, when combined with other lines of business um, metrics such as in our facilities maintenance line of business on graffiti, we can really get a sense of how the overall feel and uh, experiences for our park users. Michelle, can I jump in on this slide for just a moment, um, if that's possible? Sure. Great. Uh, so appreciate this. Is there going to be, as we go further through the slide deck, a little bit more um, context? Because I understand this is sort of a sampling of some of the broader departmental metrics uh, to just show a couple of highlights. But I, I do just want to make sure that we're setting an expectation that the ultimate report back on the metrics will include some additional context. For example, um, it would be good to know with our tree planting what the net gain of trees is um, rather than just the um, the raw number of trees planted, we also need to measure that against trees that have had to be removed from parks because they're too sick or damaged or whatever the issue might be. Uh, similarly, with, with the graffiti work orders, uh, I don't really have enough information from looking at this 
um, particular slide uh, to know what remediating graffiti within six working days is relative to to a to a national best practice or something like that. So I think that additional level of um, context for some of these categories would be uh, would be valuable or context on the community centers. Uh, like an eight percent increase in hours is great, but what that looks like on the consumer end of the community center, like what are what are the average daily operating hours, and what what is the variety of activities that that level of programming lets us realize? It, just putting out there that you know having that uh, that context of um, these metrics is important for myself and the board members to know uh, how we're making progress on the end consumer experience in all these categories. Yes, you asked a lot of great questions in there and I can pause to my colleagues, but I would say in short, I think the, the metrics and the reporting plan you'll see is the true metrics and then how we are contextualize those and report on those would be more in the annual plans, the blogs, and those sorts of things. Um, so it's a yes and. I'll defer to my colleagues. If there's... Um, I think it's important to know, and I, I think what you're alluding to, um, Mr. President, is sort of what are the baselines also that we're starting to work off of in the cycle to ramp up so that we can be able to report back and really understand um, to your point, uh, you know, when we say a 90% of graffiti work orders, um, how is that comparing to what the current work that's being done or uh, with the tree, you know, planting that you're talking about. So we all are mindful of that and we want to be able to report that back and have plans to provide sort of more contact. Some of it is in the appendices, but also Yes, I, I think that's very important, not only for you as park district board members, but also for members of the public who will be, um, our goal is to ensure that they're able to access the information um, with context and, and, and in easy ways to have measurable goals. And uh, so points very well taken and something that is in our plan to report back on in, in more depth. Great. which is a great segue um, to our approach to ongoing reporting. As just discussed, we will be utilizing multiple metrics. The performance dashboard is kind of outlined here in the middle, and that's online for people to try to look at the financials with these metrics. We also have annual reports that are broad-based and more specific, like the thriving environment report. And then we do a lot of stories and contextualizing this in websites, blogs, and social media throughout the year. And I, I want to just add uh, for context there that this, I, I believe, is a really important slide uh, for us in city government, but also for members of the public. This is a huge investment um, in for the next six years, and I think all of us can agree that it's sometimes we get mired in the fact of government reporting and trying to find out information. I know at times it's been challenging for you as council members and also for members of the public. And so uh, we're really placing an emphasis on this area and working really hard and um, I've given direction to our staff to continue to build out, you know, dashboards that are forward facing, that are easy to access, that have information um, timely updated and with accuracy as well as uh, annual reports and you know the websites blogs and social media with the overarching goal, goal that they will be comprehensive but that they will also be easy right no one wants them to be sort of difficult and confusing so we're really leaning into being uh, transparent in the next six years and providing something um, and that can be adaptable so i will say that we will lean into you and your staff as well to provide that information back to us so that we can continue to improve on developing these, but our, our baseline overall approach is to really be informative, uh, but simple and engaging. Yeah, just to jump in for a, a second there, um, Superintendent Diaz, 
uh, or I guess as I should still say uh, for a few more weeks, interim superintendent, but we're, we're getting close to taking care of that. Um, I, I think this is great. And I, I like us being very public facing and transparent about the metrics. Um, but one thing I do wanna lift up on my daily commute when I come downtown and go past Bell Street Park, uh, it's been very noticeable to myself and constituents in the Belltown neighborhood over the past two months, uh, the uh, significant increase in uh, maintenance and attention at that site. And I only highlight that because I think, you know, the, you know, the, the best uh, way to, to restore public confidence in our ability as a city to deliver essential services is to really get out there and be visible in that delivery. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, sometimes I hesitate that we over rely on a city of showing the metrics of, um, of the work we've done, but if that work isn't visible and tangible and something people can feel, uh, it doesn't, um, uh, it, it doesn't help as much in restoring public confidence in our performance. So I, I do just want to say that uh, I think in the uh, reinvigorated maintenance that parks has been undergoing has really been being noticed and appreciated in the community. And I wanted to pass along, uh, that feedback, but also say, you know, whatever we can do to make sure that that remains the ongoing cadence of that work uh, and how we can build and expand on that is something I'm very excited about uh, seeing represented um, in these dashboards as we go forward. Thank you, sir. This is a great segue to our ramp up plan because I think you're seeing some of the success of the maintenance teams um, being able to hire some more staff and get them on board in the spring and they're doing a lot of great work out there. Um, so this, our ramp up plan, we thought once you, to your point, once you've got our reporting plan, you might have more questions about how things are, are going to be looking on the ground. And so we uh, also sent over on Friday what we're calling a ramp up plan, which is also by our same line of business and detailed lines of business. And for those um, detailed lines of business that got additional cycle two investments, we reflect what that investment is. Um, we then share a little bit about our approach to getting to full service operations for each of those. And in most cases, that really does relate to cycle two investments, but there's some of our lines of business that are still um, recovering from pandemic uh, impacts to service. And so we try to reflect those as well were applicable. And then we included milestones, um, which I'll give a few examples here in a minute, um, on kind of when you'll see that um, full service delivery or in the capital realm, which is not as easy to say on a, six, on a 12 month cycle, kind of within the first few years of the cycle, what to expect, and then in the second three years of the cycle. Um, using an example that was near and dear to everyone's heart last fall as we were talking about the park district investments. Um, as you recall, one of the investments was to provide funding to winterize our uh, comfort stations in order to have them available for use year round. And there was an investment, uh, companion investment to maintenance staffing so that that was also available year round. The team worked really hard having heard your interest in this and the community's interest in order to figure out how to do that as quickly as possible. When we were talking as last fall, we were sharing that it would take the full six years to get the 60 or so comfort stations that are, that do close seasonally um, available for opening. And the team has worked through a, an approach that will get us there by the end of 2026, so two years early. And they're starting with some low hanging fruit, but also trying to make sure that we're looking at our equity zones and um, geographic uh, distribution as they develop that schedule. So that's one example of some of the important work people have done in ramp up planning. Um, in addition, you'll hear in a few minutes, more about our park ranger um, ramp up plan. We won't go into that here, but let's take AP Thunder a little bit. By the end of June, we should have our phase one um, 
Park Ranger Expansion Program operational. We're also working towards having our expanded community center and teaching center hours launched with the beginning of the school year next year, following, I'm sure, what will be another busy summer at our facilities, um, which will include the full year of our youth employment program, bringing 80 kids in over the summer. And that program will have our vandalism team fully operational and piloting some new metrics in the fall. And one we also wanted to highlight is, I think you all recall that some of our cycle one land bank sites got paused during the pandemic um, as funding was reallocated to emergency recovery. And so with the cycle two investments, we have those relaunched and the team is wanting to get those parks open to those communities as quickly as possible. And at least by the end of 2026, they believe those will all be open. And then we gave, you know, no reports properly submitted without a couple of appendices, at least from my public policy side. So we included a couple of appendices. One was directly related to Resolution 51. You had um, put forth a number of spending restrictions, statements of intent, and accountability measures. And we did a crosswalk of that to try to explain how we plan to um, adhere to those that policy direction either by directly implementing capital projects as a number of those relate to certain capital projects, reports back to the park district board, such as the one that we sent you on Friday. And then some of the um, updates may happen through a annual budget process. One specific example is there was um, a request to provide more funding to the waterfront in 2025, I believe, so you'll see a budget ask related to that um, and any other kind of impacts from multi-funded changes we will try to reflect um, how it relates to these metrics and ramp up through the regular budget process. And then in addition to that, um, we have a capital delivery strategy we recognize the importance and the level of funding that was provided to us to, um, to provide a lot of uh, capital projects, asset management projects, and new development projects to the community. And so in preparation for this, um, the team has been reflecting on lessons learned and is pursuing a, a project delivery approach that we hope that you will agree with and instill confidence in you and the members of the public that it is both um, focused on being timely and providing quality project delivery. This approach incorporates finding rec recommendations and actions resulting from the 2020 work evaluation as well as some additional outreach and um, subject matter expertise that we've engaged with since that time. And um, I guess is we'll probably want to be talking to you more at the council committee more about this approach, but it's um, it looks at how we're prioritizing and packaging projects to be most effective and efficient. It also explores alternative approaches to design bid build um, in partnership with FAS that helps us actually um, fit out those projects. And we're also assessing numerous other ideas for efficiencies and close coordination with other city departments and outside permitting agencies, as well as looking at the final slate of investments and if there's any adjustments needed to our staffing. And finally, again, looking at our performance metrics, um, the life cycle cost or life cycle metrics we've discussed with you before, board president. Um, and we're even looking forward to um, pursuing a map-based project dashboard to help um, community members look more closely and easily at what we have going on in our current projects. And then finally, um, we want to recognize that while we have been working diligently, we do need to acknowledge that not every aspect of implementation is finalized and we will continue to work through some strategies and some critical areas, whether that be as our new programs evolve um, and we develop metrics on those, 
there's a lot of interdepartmental work. An example of that is the resiliency hub work with OSC and Office of Emergency Management. That will be um, a longer term coordination, but we are continuing to work through our decarbonization process while that's happening concurrently. And then working with some community partners on some other projects, um, the Equitable Park Development Fund, as you know, in our, in our local agreement has a very strong role for the Board of Park and Recreation Commissioners. So we'll be engaging with them next month to try to work on criteria and approach to that work. And with that, for any other questions well thank you so much for that presentation and uh, really appreciate this engagement with the board uh, to get feedback on these performance metrics um, I asked some questions during the initial presentation so I'm happy to hand it over to other board members before I get in to some of the other details uh, are there any board members who have questions for the parks panel? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, what can we're, we're going to pivot to another presentation on the Rangers? Yes, after this. Um, yes. So I'm going to we're going to hold questions on the Rangers until that agenda item. Um, but especially some of the initiatives in the presentation regarding vandalism and remediating vandalism there was an indication of quarter three of this year being the deadline to stand up the vandalism mitigation team um, can we talk a little bit about uh, what the vision is in the department for how to structure that uh, how that team can get activated by a citizen complaint will it be find it fix it uh, you know, how, how should we engage with constituents to be able to utilize that vandalism remediation service? Sure. I'm Andy Sheffer. Um, we've recently in, uh, integrated the Find It, Fix It app with our uh, work order system. So all uh, inquiries that are entered into the Find It, Fix It app um, go directly to the uh, specific crews and vandalism response is a combination of the trades um, and we'll be able to react a lot, lot quicker using the Find and Fix It app um, as the main line of communication. Really appreciate that clarification. Um, this is really exciting stuff, guys. I really appreciate the work that you're putting together on this. Um, and if there's other feedback that board members want to submit, uh, what are some of the deadlines to kind of finalize some of these considerations? There's really no uh, deadline. Um, we're happy to, uh, we met your deadline and we're happy to continue to work with you and your staff um, for simple services on how we could add things. Um, but this this is a, also meant, I should say, to be an ongoing you know, uh, work product uh, with you all as oversight council members um, in the community as we continue to build out some of the reporting mechanisms back to it. But um, we're happy to do that at any time. And um, outside of the, I know there will be normal reporting schedules and mandates um, that our staffs will keep us organized on. Um, we're happy to meet with you or any of your colleagues or staff at any time throughout the process um, as issues emerge day to day. And we'll also be taking this to the Board of Parking Recreation Commissioners later this month to take their feedback as well. Excellent. Um, I do think it would also be um, a useful, a good use of time to work with the um, uh, Office of the City Auditor on looking at some of these performance metrics too, um, to maybe 
um, get feedback as we shape them to to help look at how we can evaluate as we go forward. But uh, on the whole, um, I think this is a really good start and really appreciate um, the department being proactive. Tracy, you have some feedback? Members, you were sent a very big packet of information on Friday, but I want to call out one specific part of that packet, which is Appendix 1, and it specifically includes the responses to a number of the statements of legislative intent, as well as um, spending restrictions that we included in Resolution 51, which adopted that next six-year spending plan. So I just I want to, to call out that um, particular part of the materials because it does provide some of the responses back on some of those, um, those items. Um, related to um, things like uh, turf at Judkin Parks that I know council member or that Commissioner Nelson had an interest in. Um, I know you had some interest in some of the um, uh, benchmarking uh, industry standards. Um, national, there's some information there about national standards um, and benchmarks for completing certain types of uh, park related activities. So just wanted to call that specific document out for council members, I don't think it, um, the parks is probably going to go through that today, but I just want to make sure that you know that it's there and that they are uh, in that effort uh, making uh, um, a response to those requirements that were in Resolution 51. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I think we will close out that agenda item and we're keeping the same panel, but we are pivoting to another agenda item. And will the clerk please read item four into the record? Agenda item four, report on park ranger hiring, training and activities for briefing and discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Clerk. And we are still here with uh, our parks panel. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and jump into this presentation on the park rangers. Excellent. Thank you again, Mr. President. And we are pleased to present to you um, just a high level overview and be available for any questions about the expansion of our park ranger program, which we know has been uh, very important and near and dear to all of our city leaders and indicative of the investment that again was made through the um, park district funding uh, which was recently passed. So we uh, were invited today, we presented back our report to you uh, in January 31st of this year, uh, discussing our park ranger job duties, recruitment strategies and training. And so um, I'm pleased to walk you through uh, our approach to this, uh, particularly with an emphasis on 2023 and going forward and then be available to answer uh, any questions. So. So just as a reminder, uh, the investment strategy given uh, through the district funding was the allocation of $3 million, uh, which adds up to 26 rangers for a total of 28. Currently, the Parks Department has two full-time rangers. And the purpose of the ranger program and the regeneration and growth will be to enhance safety and promote voluntary compliance of our park rules throughout um, our downtown city parks right now is where the program is focused and um, authorized to do work and uh, with the potential to expand to other parts of the city uh, subject to some labor negotiations that are currently pending. Uh, the program is overall structured to support our one Seattle vision of this thriving healthy city and also to create a vibrant downtown. And, Particularly coming out of the pandemic, I just want to note that you know parks continue to prove themselves to be uh, essential infrastructure uh, that have seen us through in and out of the pandemic. Uh, that one place that we could all go to and be part of uh, when the entire world was sheltered. And so we have a duty and a responsibility to continue to provide safe and welcoming park spaces to really build up uh, this sense of community pride, but the health and wellness that parks provided. We want our citizens to be um, utilizing our parks, in our parks, have our parks active, and again, to feel this uh, semblance of safety um, and a sense of welcomeness. And I want to also um, expand on a point here that in the Park Ranger Program, we will be implementing uh, this no wrong door approach to city service. And it's also a way, what that means is that all of our employees, but particularly our park rangers who will be working alongside the community, alongside our staff, um, 
day in and day out in our parks as visible members and representatives of our city government. We'll be trained to ensure that citizens um, are afforded the right answers, the right connections, uh, and the right ability to find results and solutions to their problem. And quite simply, sometimes uh, in government, we tend to do finger pointing. Uh, that's not my jurisdiction, that's XYZ department. We don't handle that, you need to call here. Um, and citizens are sometimes left, in my experience, with sort of a feeling of dissatisfaction and really don't, you know, uh, care if, this, if the city sidewalk or the street or a tree uh, or watering issues uh, are part of another jurisdiction. They just have a right and a need to get responses and to have action done. And so we're really leading out on that effort um, to ensure that our staff is trained to give those individuals the right information um, to do our own self-reporting uh, to other city departments. And we're beginning to build more alliances with our other city departments. And I just wanted to highlight that and that will be part of our park ranger program. The park ranger duties are going to be focused on what we are calling the three E's, education, engagement, and enforcement. And the education prong of a park ranger's duty is really to be there to educate our community members and our visitors about our Seattle's lush park system and the associated rules of conduct and city resources that go into maintaining our near 500 park uh, sites that we have here in the city, city of Seattle. We also will be doing engagement. Uh, because we are going to be in the community, in our parks, we want our rangers to be visual, visual ambassadors. Um, they will not be there just to walk around and not talk to people and not interact. Uh, to the contrary, uh, they are going to be trained um, and they are going to be recruited based upon their uh, desire to be community stewards, um, individuals who have a desire to uh, import a sense of welcomeness and uh, attract people into the park and to provide them information and to teach them about our park system here in Seattle uh, and about the preservation of our natural resources and how we are establishing ourselves as a model city for parks. So we really want them to be engaged to uh, be going up to people, to be talking to them, seeing if they need help, uh, being useful where they can. And again, just continuous this advancement of a safe and welcoming environment. And of course, as park rangers, they're also gonna be uh, required to do enforcement. So supporting compliance with our park regulations is really important. Um, issuing warnings or citations. Um, they will be trained on how to uh, confront and uh, approach uh, certain situations that might arise in an urban park assist, uh, city system like ours. They will also be trained and will know how to act and when they are not uh, to act. And what are the other available uh, public safety partners that we have in the city? Uh, should we need services from um, our other city partners like the police or our paramedics or our, our fire department um, or um, some of our unified care response teams. So it'll be this overarching approach, but it will be rooted in these three E's to really uh, deliver a comprehensive program that's meeting uh, the needs of our citizens and city government on multiple levels. Superintendent uh, Diaz, can um, I jump in for a second on this slide uh, before we go forward? Um, is the department envisioning an expansion of the role of the park rangers? Um, these things look like they're within the confines of how the ranger program has historically operated, but I do just want to confirm since that was a matter of discussion when we did the Metropolitan Park District renewal and just want to make sure that that is the um, current that, it, that what is being proposed is not um, necessarily an expansion of the uh, current parameters of the duties of the park rangers. That's correct, sir. There, there is no deviation from um, the envisioned model that you just spoke to and what was key among the members in your, your collective approval of this program. This is simply a uh, taking the program and preparing it for expansion, expansion in terms of hiring, um, and also a focus on uh, 
the duties that were there, but really sort of uh, focusing them, them into three sort of main areas. Um, so nothing is expanding or deviating from the current authorizations or the, uh, the way that we believe you all envision this program. Uh, but this is our now uh, taking that and putting it into a program that we can then grow and expand upon in the year to come that will best serve those needs. Great, thank you. So I want to talk about park ranger and recruitment, which is really vital to the success of this program. There are, um, it is a concerted effort being placed right now, and I just want all of the members to really feel comfortable um, and aware of how we're approaching um, the types of individuals that we are recruiting into our park ranger program. First and foremost, they have to be community oriented. They have to have a desire to be among the community, among the city, and be sort of that, as I keep talking about this ambassador, representing the best of our city, um, ensuring that they are community facing, that they have um, a real understanding of how our community works in Seattle um, and the unique challenges that we have. And so we really want to focus on individuals uh, that have a passion and a desire to do that work as well as a passion and desire to be part of our amazing park system um, and to be sort of have that national or excuse me, that local love of parks, the way that some of our national park rangers have of their national park system. Um, we are blessed uh, to be this evergreen, uh, you know, state and this emerald city and there's much pride there. And so we want to make sure that we're getting individuals that have that sort of sweet combination of both um, and a desire to lead out to improve the park system. Among the minimum qualifications will be a one year of experience in parks uh, or recreation or some related field of security um, that then can combine with um, an education or training experience that provides equivalent background uh, required to perform this type of work. They need to be committed to uh, public safety approaches at faceted levels, right? There is no one approach to public safety as we know, and it's really important that our rangers are trained um, and recruited to understand the nuances and uh, to understand the best practices to ensure our city is advancing those in the most uh, socially just uh, way that we can. Uh, as I mentioned, excellent customer service skills. Uh, we want them to be individuals that you all and your staff and your community members will get to know and can call on and that will be reliable uh, to meet your needs. Just as many of you rely on um, some of our excellent uh, park and recreation staff that we have working at our community centers, um, in our urban parks, in our natural uh, regional park systems, they will be an extension of that modeling excellence at all levels of their work. And um, there will be an education first approach with all of the work that they're doing. And again, they will need to be also able to pass police level background checks um, so that they can uh, be there uh, to do the work that's needed of a park ranger. And I just wanted to share with you just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we're working with. Um, we have partnered with a consulting firm to really get out and ensure that our um, approach is wide, varied, and broad, and bringing us a diverse set of candidates. On park ranger training, so once we have selected the first tranche of park rangers, and I should report actually uh, that as of today, we have over 100, if not more, um, applications from that uh, recruitment that we've been doing. Um, I was pleased to participate in a town hall recruitment event um, with some of our staff about a week and a half ago to answer community questions and to better lean into that. And the result has been really, really positive. So I uh, just wanted you to know that we are uh, on track and we feel comfortable that we have a good uh, cadre of people that are interested in applying. Once they are hired, the Rangers will complete a six week in-house training academy uh, which will be a combination of classroom and field work. Um, they will be uh, trained by our individual staff members as well as some partner agencies who have stepped up uh, to do this effort with us, among them the, um, our SPD Communications Center, 
the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, uh, and Portland's Parks and Recs. I want to give a shout out to our uh, neighbor to the south who has a wonderful uh, park uh, ranger program. And our staff has been in communication with them and they have committed to helping us build out this program, which is really exciting. Um, and also when we talk about the communication center training, it's really so that the rangers have direct lines of communications with the individuals in our city that may need to respond to a park situation or uh, a life and safety health matter, um, they will have the ability to do that. The primary curriculum of the training will include the welcoming and onboarding strategies, how to work best with the public, knowing the city of Seattle, knowing our communities, understanding safety, first aid and emergency response, enforcement protocols, really important, how to effectively properly, lawfully, and justfully engage with community, respectful of all members of our society, um, and will be trained in de-escalation, um, and will really be trained on what you can do and what you do not do as a park ranger. And then the sort of deeper dive is the sort of evolution of things and issues uh, that you can encounter. There's a, a myriad of issues beyond the three E's, uh, that come up every day um, in a park system. And so we want them to be trained and connected with every part of our uh, working operations so that they can also be the sort of eyes and ears and uh, letting us know about infrastructure problems or vandalism or graffiti or maintenance issue or an errant water system. Um, they can also be able to sort of deep dive into that and be problem solving uh, solution oriented in that approach. So. This is, in a nutshell, is our uh, ramp up program. And um, did I miss a slide? Maybe we, there is, I knew there were more slides here. <laughs> um, training and accountability in consistent with what we just stated to you earlier about the cycle to ramp up. We want to be um, continue to be transparent to the community and work with the park district board as well as our park commissioners on um, reporting out on the work that is being done. So some of the things that you all asked for um, and for us to report on are the number of verbal warnings issues and the reasons why. So we will be training and tracking those issues. Uh, also the number of written warnings and citations um, that are issued and why and uh, things that perhaps are being referred over to the police department. Um, and we will be having metrics for that. We also will be, I'm going to also be asking our rangers to report out on positive interactions with communities as well. Um, and I anticipate that there will be a significant number of what we call positive interactions, but you know, really being helpful and, and problem solving and connecting people in that spirit of no wrong door. Um, so we're gonna sort of track that internally. And if you all would like to see that, we will track that back with you as well. Um, and then continuing to work with you on the, you know, the number of park rangers that we're hiring um, and where they're being deployed. And then um, the additional metric will be an annual um, uh, park ranger app uh, of violations that can be reported uh, through our park code, but online and consistent with other ways that we're trying to be more forward facing. And then I want to just sort of end on or talk about initial deployment here um, and some of the members have asked questions so I just want to clarify here and you saw this in our report back the initial deployment will focus on 21 downtown parks that's over 46 acres um, and you can see there on the map um, some of the parks that will be highlighted in our downtown neighborhood um, they will work seven days a week from six in the morning to 9 p.m. at night they will work and rotate um, in three daily teams um, in cohorts of two. So there should never, and ideally there will always be two rangers uh, working together in the downtown areas. And there will also be an additional emphasis consistent uh, with your direction on uh, at Cal Anderson Park, uh, which you know has gone through great renovation and really thriving right now on did a, a walk through there with uh, Council Member Lewis and community members and have been there several times at night. Um, and it is so well activated and really uh, thriving in many ways. We want to continue uh, that sense of activation. 
And we also, in the emergence of City Hall Park, which I know you are all tracking and we are working hard on uh, with a plan to sort of reopen this uh, spring, uh, we want to uh, have a dedicated crew uh, with providing emphasis work through our park rangers at City Hall Park. Uh, and then deployment considerations will be uh, shaped by the following factors. You know, sometimes there will be a special event going on in our city. It might be the Pride Parade or uh, a particular permitted event that uh, we know is going on and we'll want to put additional rangers uh, to support that park uh, to ensure that public safety and assistance is being given as needed. There could be uh, incidents being reported to us by some of our public safety uh, partners telling us about particular uh, locations or we see an uptick in crime or an uptick in reported vandalism. So we might deploy rangers to work in those particular parks while easing them back from others from time to time. It will also be shaped by public uh, complaints and information that we're getting from your staff as well as the community. So we can kind of develop a strategy of where we should be focused. Um, the park code violations, graffiti, vandalism, and hotspots want to keep uh, a concerted effort on ensuring that we are meeting those and then reducing the numbers of those activities uh, before we sort of focus on other areas in the system. Um, and then also being in communication with our existing concierge and uh, park activation teams, supporting them in their work so that they can feel uh, equipped to do their work um, and really feel safe together. So. Uh, this will very much be a collective team approach to the work in the community. And here's our expansion timeline uh, focusing um, on 2023. So in January, we began phase one um, and we did our recru uh, recruitment and onboarding uh, with the goal to hire 13 uh, new park rangers. Um, and that would include the existing uh, and so we are currently in that phase right now in Q1 from January to April. As I mentioned, we are uh, very much into the recruitment process now and acquiring the applications. We'll be doing the vetting and the screening. And then in uh, the mid uh, May to July, we'll be focusing on our training academy and getting those individuals onboarded uh, and trained up. And then uh, in Towards Q3, we will look at beginning our first deployment of phase one of the Ranger expansion program with that seven day coverage. And then uh, at the end of the year, we will then uh, evaluate how we will go into phase two, uh, going ramping up to the 28 authorized positions, um, being shaped by what we learned also in phase one. So we've kind of set up this timeline. Um, really pleased to report uh, thanks to our staff who is working really hard to deliver a model program that we are on track for meeting our goals and feel really confident in speaking with you today um, that this timeline uh, should work uh, with the caveat that we have to go through obvious the hiring process and as you all know that can take time um, to ensure that we get the, the proper applicants in place that they fill out their forms correctly, that we do the background checks, that we uh, find the right candidates. So I just want to point out that although we feel confident about that, we might need to adjust that uh, a little bit, but hoping not to. And with that, that is our report. Um, and just want to thank you for being so supportive of this. This plus the uh, cycle two ramp up, this is part of the cycle two ramp up, but this undergirding the capital improvements to our park system is really going to be a positive for our uh, city of Seattle and our parks department. And I'm just so pleased uh, to be coming in at such a pivotal time uh, with your direction and providing uh, me and our entire team here uh, the ability to deliver great things for our parks. So just want to thank you um, on that. Thank you so much. I see that Councilmember Peterson has a question. I I'm going to ask a maybe a brief question first and then hand it over to council member peterson uh can we go back superintendent diaz to the slide where we're discussing the training right uh yes um so is how much does this represent um an enhancement of the current training regime that the department has been using to train and retain 
our current Ranger service? Well, um, you know, as, as we, you know, we have two park rangers now. So um, with the goal of ramping up to 28, uh, this is an enhanced curriculum, I would say. Uh, you know, we'll have more people working together. So it, again, want to point out it's not deviating or changing, but I really see it as expanding more uh, on what our current rangers are doing now. So. Those individuals are well trained along with our security services teams on doing this work. Uh, but I really want to emphasize, especially starting out with my tenure here, sort of my approach and direction of this program is to focus on these three things, but with a really an enhanced focus on public engagement, um, really forward facing community interaction that's positive, uh, and building connections and alliances more with our partners in the police department, the fire department. I've had really great conversations uh, with my fellow directors of the chief of police and the chief of the fire department who are also committed to making this program successful so that if the rangers need emergency or first aid response, they're going to have direct lines of communications with individuals in those departments to be responsive. And, um, and also we're really gonna be teaching our rangers to learn more about city departments. So, Nothing's really deviating or different, but I would say it's going to be much more heightened, um, much more uh, sophisticated and really expansive in the sense of within the city. I, it, it's this one Seattle vision we can talk about, but park rangers will only be successful if supported by all of our other city partners to do their, their work. Great, thank you. Uh, count, uh, board member Peterson. Thank you, Board President Lewis, and thank you, Superintendent Diaz and your, your team there. Look forward to your, your upcoming confirmation as well. And uh, thank you for these presentations. Uh, my question is about the, I think, believe it's slide eight that has the map of the city. Thank you for thank you. providing the map. Um, my concern here is that it's focused just on downtown, and I know that that was some sort of informal arrangement to roll out the expansion, but I just want to make a note that, you know, there are parks throughout Seattle that would benefit from the Rangers. I know when there are issues that, that crop up in parks in, in my district, like Gasworks Park, the last couple of weeks, the executive will say, well, Fear not, we have park rangers that we, you know, we're expanding the program. And then when I look into it further, there's this caveat of it being downtown. And so it's a little bit of a mixed message to um, my constituents and people throughout the city. So I just want to encourage that the sooner that uh, there can be flexibility and where they're deployed so that they can be strategically deployed where there might be the most need to have um, eyes on the trails, so to speak. Um, I think that'll be really helpful because, um, because we know that SPD is not able to respond uh, to certain calls if there's just something going on that's not criminal in nature, but there needs to be a city employee to look after the situation. The park rangers would be a, an obvious choice for that. So would encourage the, the executives quickly as possible to figure out how to get that flexibility to have a more strategic deployment citywide. Thank you, that's just a comment. Yeah, and uh, board member Peterson, thank you. I, I wanna give Parks a chance to respond, but my understanding is we are currently somewhat hamstrung by um, bargaining constraints that the department is trying to fix to give us that flexibility. And I'm very supportive of, of us getting that flexibility, but I'll give the department a moment to respond to that question. Well, I just want to say first and foremost that we recognize um, the need to be responsive, safe and welcoming in all parts of our city, right? In every single council district and at every single Seattle park. So. No one park is more important than the other, um, in, in our opinion, um, and the residents have a right to feel safe in every single park. Um, 
And so we concur that we want to work um, through the proper channels. The, the, there is an existing labor contract in place um, that restricts the parks rangers to the downtown core. Um, and that is why the program is built out as such. And we will be working with the, the executive and um, asking them to continue to work um, with the labor negotiation uh, teams um, to see if there is a possibility uh, to expand the program. But I will point out that we are ready to adapt the program um, to grow out and build out based upon the model that was just shown in slide seven. So some of those informed decisions that will go to the downtown areas when we talk about you know, special permits as an example, or a special activity, or a, a tick in crime, a hotspot, an area that has more vandalism, that model can be applied uh, to any part of the city should we be authorized or expand further um, that we will use this model um, to grow that program wherever we see fit so it's building this program now um, recognizing we are under the constraint of downtown but hoping to really learn the best practices of that with uh, the goal of being as you mentioned uh, reachable and so serv serviceable to all parts of our city so that is our approach. That is our goal, um, and uh, and we hope to be able to realize uh, some of that. Uh, Board Member Peterson. Follow up? Yeah, thank yes. you. Just to I I know the issue of bargaining has been mentioned. I just since you know some of us are on the labor relations policy committee, I'll look forward to drilling into that a little bit. I've not seen anything in writing about it. I've just heard that word bantied about, but I've not actually seen in writing where there's this restriction. So I'll be, um, I, I know we'll sort of confirm that when we have some some bandwidth to do that soon. So thank you. Are there any other board members with questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, well, thank you to our parks panel. Really appreciated the opportunity to uh, get an update on some of these topics from last fall and check in on how they are coming along and on the uh, implementation timelines. Um, we will, of course, continue to be engaged uh, as a board and as a council in the development of the uh, promises for the six year Metropolitan Park District. And we will uh, continue to do so in partnership and um, almost certainly discuss some of these themes and topics, uh, Superintendent Diaz, during your confirmation hearings on Wednesday. Uh, I don't have any other items of business for um, this afternoon's check-in. So if there's nothing for the good of the order, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the Metropolitan Park District Board. Uh, the next scheduled meeting of the Metropolitan Park District Board will be held on Monday, June 26th of 2023, following the council briefing meeting at approximately 3 p.m. There will be no further business and we stand adjourned. Recording stopped. Thank you.